Lyme disease is a must-know topic, highly testable. You gotta know this. It's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is transmitted by the Ixodes tick. And let's not forget that the Ixodes tick is also a vector for Babesia. Borrelia belongs to the spirochetes which are spiral shaped bacteria. They are spiral shaped with axial filaments and along with Borrelia these also include Leptospira and Treponema. More specifically Treponema pallidum which is the spiral sheet that causes syphilis. So these are just some things to keep in mind and let's remember that only Borrelia can be visualized using aniline dyes. For example, right or GMSA stain. It is the larger spirochete in comparison to Leptospira and Treponema. So it's larger. Borrelia is gram-negative, micro aerophilic, and typically difficult to culture. So it is indeed transmitted by the Ixodes tick. More specifically, the examiner might bring up Ixodes scapularis. The reservoir that is the organism where the Ixodes tick can be found on is the white-tailed deer. Sources have reported that the adult ticks are found on the white tailed deer, whereas the nymph stage of the tick, the non-adult form, are found on the white-footed mouse. So these are two reservoirs where the Ixodes tick can be found. To be really specific, adult form in the white-tailed deer and the more non-adult nymph form in the white-footed mouse. Examiners could ask about it. The main areas where this disease is endemic to are the northeastern United States, for example places like Connecticut, and it also can be found in the upper parts of the Midwest, for example places like Wisconsin. Let's go ahead and take a look at the clinical manifestations of this disease. So let's go ahead and take a look at the early stages first, and the first one being the localized stage, which typically takes place during the very first few days of the tick bite to one month after the tick bite. And some things we want to be looking out for is erythema migrans. This is ridiculously high yield and can definitely pop up in the question stem. It happens in about 80% of the patients and develops at the site of the tick bite. It is the pathognomic lesion of Lyme disease. It's described as a red expanding lesion with concentric circles. When I say concentric circles, I mean that it almost appears like a target or a targetoid lesion. So the examiner could actually give you a picture of the erythema migrans rash. Along with this rash, the patient can also have fatigue, malaise, and lethargy. Also a mild headache along with neck stiffness, myalgias, and arthralgias. So that is the early localized stage of the disease. There is also the early disseminated form of the disease, which fits between weeks to months after the tick bite. And some things that can be seen in this early disseminated stage of the disease is carditis. Things like AV block can occur. And we can also see some neurologic things, for example, like a unilateral or bilateral cranial nerve defects involving the facial nerve. The facial nerve is CN cranial nerve number seven. So that can take place. And we can also see things like meningitis and encephalitis. So that is the cranial nerve seven of the 12 cranial nerves, and we definitely have to keep those in mind for step one. Cranial nerve one is olfactory, cranial nerve two is optic, cranial nerve three is oculomotor, cranial nerve four is trochlear, five, trigeminal, abducens is six, facial seven, eight is vestibulocochlear, nine is glossopharyngeal, 10, vagus, 11 accessory nerve, and 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. Definitely want to keep those in mind for step one, but the neurologic symptoms here are involving cranial nerve 7 for Lyme disease, causing that facial nerve palsy. 
with early disseminated disease, you can also see migratory arthralgias, conjunctivitis, the skin lesions, erythema migrans can disseminate and we can get multiple erythema migrans, not just at the site of the tick bite, but in other places. So we can get multiple erythema migrans. And we can also get lymphad enopathy. So with the initial symptoms, the early stages, we definitely want to be looking out for the facial nerve palsy. We definitely want to be looking out for the erythema migrans. We also want to be looking out for these flu-like symptoms. Let's go ahead and take a look at late or chronic stages of Lyme disease, which is between a time span of months to years after the tick bite. And some things we want to be paying attention to are disabling arthritis, usually involving the knee, and also some neurologic problems like encephalomyelitis and peripheral neuropathies. So we broke the manifestations of Lyme disease into different stages. The early localized, the early disseminated, and also the later stages. Let's definitely not forget that the knee is the most common affected joint in Lyme disease. The seventh cranial nerve palsy is the most common neurologic manifestation of Lyme disease. And it's important to point out that while it can be unilateral or bilateral, bilateral Bell's palsy is by far highly predictive of Lyme disease. And in fact, it's been said that bilateral Bell's palsy on the exam is Lyme disease until proven otherwise. And also with regards to cardiac manifestation, which I will be coming back to later on, it's been said that the transient AV block is the most common cardiac manifestation Making a lot of progress here, let's take a quick look at the treatment for this disease. Doxycycline is the drug of choice for patients, PTS for patients not pregnant and greater than or equal to eight years old. If in the question stem they are pregnant or under eight years old, then the answer is not doxycycline. It is amoxicillin. This is most definitely a testable point. The reason why doxycycline is contraindicated in young children under 8 as well as pregnant women is because it can cause permanent discoloration of teeth and retardation of skeletal development in exposed children and fetuses. So that's why we give amoxicillin instead. Side effects of drugs most definitely tested. Another thing with the treatment is that cardiac and neurological manifestations, I put NM, other than the seventh cranial nerve palsy. This is treated with IV ceftriaxone. Just for some review, let's remember that doxycycline is a tetracycline, and uniquely, it is the only tetracycline that is excreted hepatically. It goes through the liver, so it is fecally eliminated, and it does not go through the kidneys. It can be used in patients who are having renal failure or renal problems. We don't want to take it with milk, antacids, or iron-containing preparations because divalent cations inhibit its absorption in the gut. Some toxicity, as we mentioned, was the teeth discoloration. It can cause some GI distress and also inhibition of bone growth in children. Photosensitivity has also been mentioned. Let's remember that amoxicillin has the same mechanism of action as penicillin. Essentially, it binds to penicillin-binding proteins, the transpeptidases, it blocks transpeptidase cross-linking of peptidoglycan, and it activates autolytic enzymes. And some side effects that we can look out for with amoxicillin are hypersensitivity reactions, rash, and pseudomembranous colitis. Ceftriaxone is also used for meningitis and gonorrhea. It's excreted in the bile, so it can be used in patients with renal failure, along with that doxycycline. These are just some brief high-yield points I wanted to bring up and mention with these drugs. I know we've gone through a lot here, and if you're still watching, I really can't thank you enough for checking this video out. The only other thing I want to include here about Lyme disease, which is indeed the number one tick-borne disease in the United States, it's so high yield. The only other thing I really want to include here is a comment on the carditis and the heart issues that come up and arise here with this disease. I want to talk a little bit about the third degree complete heart block, HB for heart block.
Now what happens in the third degree complete AV block is that the atria and ventricles beat independently of each other. You've got the blood coming in through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, down into the right ventricle, being pumped to the lungs, coming back to the left atrium, going down through the mitral valve, and then to the left ventricle. The problem with this is that in third degree complete heart block, the atria and the ventricles are beating independently of each other. Both the P waves and the QRS complexes are present, although the P waves bear no relation to the QRS complexes. The atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate, and we usually treat this with a pacemaker. So just for review, I know I'm not the best drawer in the world, but bear with me. On the EKG, we've got the P wave, we've got got that QRS complex, and then we've got that T wave, so P, which is where the atria depolarize, and then we've got that QRS, that QRS complex, which is where the ventricles depolarize, and then we've got that T wave, put T right here, which is where the ventricles are repolarized. And by the end of that T right here, both the atria and the ventricle are fully repolarized at the end of that T wave completion. The point that I want to make is that in third degree complete heart block, the atria and the ventricles are beating independently of each other. The P waves and the QRS complexes, they're there, but the P waves have no relation to the QRS complex. And the atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate. This is usually treated with a pacemaker. So this is the type of heart block that examiners can ask about with Lyme disease. And with a third degree heart block, Canon A waves may be seen. So we talked about third degree. Let's not forget the first degree heart block. And this is where the P to R interval is prolonged in first degree heart block. We don't see this one in Lyme. This is just for review. Usually benign and asymptomatic and no treatment is required. And then we've got second degree heart block, which can be divided up into Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1 is also sometimes referred to as Wanky Bach. Kind of a strange name, I know. Wanky Bach. And this is where we see a progressive lengthening of the P to R interval until a beat is dropped. And what I mean by that is that a P wave is not followed by a QRS complex. So let's remember that Wanky Bach gives you a warning before the beat is dropped. So we'll see a progressive increase in the PR length before a beat, a QRS, is not seen. So Mobitz type 1, Wangi Bach, it gives you a warning before that happens. You're going to be seeing that lengthening between the P and the R, gradually progressing until you won't see that QRS pop up. The Mobitz type 1 is usually asymptomatic, so it's usually not causing too many problems. Whereas Mobitz type 2 is more problematic than type 1, and there's no warning of a dropped beat in Mobitz type 2 you'll have dropped beats that are not preceded by a change in the length of that P to R interval. It's often found as a 2 to 1 block, and what I mean by that is there will be two or more P waves to one QRS response. It can progress to that third degree heart block, which is what we see in Lyme disease. Okay, so Mobitz type 2 can progress to that third degree heart block. Both third degree and uh, Mobitz type 2 are treated with pacemakers. So first degree and the second degree heart blocks that I've mentioned, these are things just to tie in and to keep you thinking about these. They're testable. So that's pretty much all I want to say about this topic. Thank you so much for checking this out. Don't forget that works cited and page references can be found in the YouTube description below. I'm going to also add in some more interesting high yield points below as well. Thank you so much for checking this out. I hope it was somewhat helpful in your studies.